All right, brother, I believe we're ready to begin this evening. Uh, we will be in 1 Peter, the first chapter, of verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope until the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you with the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, this is a peculiar expression in Scripture. It's the only way that it's expressed quite in this way. The, the, the thought is brought across, but it's a, the only time he uses this phrase, the loins of your mind. Uh, for the benefit of the children here, I, I thought I, I, I would define exactly what that means, what loins are. That is the, the parts of the body between the hips and the lower ribs. And this is especially regarded as the seed of p physical strength or, or power in the, in the body. And uh, the, the phrase to gird up your loins means to, to prepare yourself for something that requires readiness or strength, something that requires some endurance. So in other words, to gird up your loins spiritually is to put yourself in a position where you can quickly and with minimal hindrance use the strength, power, or capacity which you've been given God with. Amen. However, our text doesn't merely say to gird up your loins, but it says to gird up the loins of your mind. Yeah. Uh, see, your mind has a certain utility. It has a strength to it. It has a, a usefulness that you can use to accomplish certain tasks. You know, God's given you this as your ability to be able to use your mind. So the girding up the loins of your mind is to apply all of your mental strength to accomplish what you've been given to do without being drawn away to other things. Uh, to, uh, to, and also to do so at any given time. There's, there's, a, there's a sense of readiness in it. The idea is not only to be able to use your capacity to the fullest amount, but also to be able to do so without delay, to be, uh, um, to be quick on your feet. That's, that's, that's expressed in another way. It says uh, whenever we want to be ready to answer um, uh, about the hope that's within us, that's, that's involved in this, to, to gird up the loins of your mind. Um, the char this charge is given to all the saints of God with, with the state of the world in mind and also with the state of our own natural capacities and propensities. You know, we, we live in a world uh, where there's a whole he host of enemies against us who are quick to, mon to uh, um, take advantage of these moments when we're bogged down by the cares of the world. You know, and and man, man in his natural state tends to... Uh, um, the, the, the natural reaction of the flesh is to be slow, is to, to, to not understand. Men naturally have the propensity to become distracted to the hurt of their capacity to react in a consistent manner. So to, to, to gird up the loins of one's mind is something that doesn't happen automatically. This is something that, that you have to work at, hence the exhortation. This, this takes effort and diligence in, in order to you, for you to accomplish it. This ability to be able to re react in circumstances in which we find ourselves, when we're given to see that action is needed, that something has to be done, uh, this is also re required, it is acquired before the circumstance happens. That's, uh, we, we see this also in trial, that you, you, aren't, you, aren't given, you may be given grace in the trial, but you are prepared, you, you yourself are prepared to face it beforehand. You're not, gonna, you're not suddenly going to get, get this ability this is an ability which has to be, you know, crafted. It can't be obtained on the fly, so to speak. So he continues, he says, be sober. And not only ought we to be in a state of readiness, but we ought to be careful of involving ourselves in anything that would hinder us from doing so. Uh, sobriety is, is similar to girding up your loins in the sense that it involves this sense of readiness, but it's different because it emphasizes more of what you choose not to do. See, sobriety is a state which must be maintained. Amen. Uh, there, there are a whole host of things which can be ingested, so to speak, spiritually, that can cause us to not be able to see things properly. Uh, we see this concept, concept mirrored in the physical as well, that sobriety is the opposite of drunkenness. And drunkenness is, something, uh, is a condition which comes upon a person because of something that they have allowed themselves to ingest, which causes the loss of the ability to be able to per perceive the reality of the world around them, yeah. as it really is. It, it may cause them to act in a way that they otherwise wouldn't act, because they've forgotten things which they're ordinarily considerate of concerning the truth of the world around them. However, this being said, I'm not saying that, in this sense, sobriety is just not merely being in a state of being drunk. But sobriety is a state that's maintained by making a conscious choice to not take in anything which causes inebriation. 
In some instances, this may actually involve choosing to ingest things which boost awareness, yeah. taking in things that uh, help our ability to be able to stay awake and aware. In Christ, as we travel through this world, we're constantly being presented with things to take in. I mean, it's, it's hard to get through even one day without being barraged by advertisements for things that the world finds pleasure in. You know, I mean, just, just being in the world, we have, we have to fight against this. But uh, um, every, sing every single day, Satan will make his appeal to you. He may present you with some things that you used to have pleasure in, that you used to be satisfied with, you know. But we also have to be mindful that God does the same thing. The Spirit makes his appeal to you every day, too. He holds out his, his mercies that he has that are new every day. Every day, he holds out his provision to us. He, he gives us the ability to, to be as Daniel was, to, to, uh, to not be, defile ourselves with the king's meat or with the wine he drank. You know, he, he chose instead to eat pulse and to drink water. Well, spiritually, we, we're eating pulse, so to speak. And, 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 and the world, just as they were uh, um, confounded at the, that the fact that Daniel's countenance was fairer than all the other ones who had drank this wine and eaten this meat, we spiritually, uh, it's, it's our countenance is fairer than those who have chosen, chosen to indulge themselves in the world's pleasures. Uh, pulse, you know, is something that, that I, uh, all, the things that we partake of, the world doesn't necessarily see them as something to be satisfied with. But we have found and experienced that to be more satisfying with what we used to eat. So then he continues, and hope unto the end. Now as we travel through this life and we're laboring to set ourselves apart from the world around us in a state of readiness for anything which might come against us and being careful to maintain this spiritual purity in Christ Jesus, this sensitivity to all the dangers around us, we do so pointed in a certain direction. All these things are unto something. And none of these things are an end to themselves. And they're, they're not meant to be the way in which we'll exist forever. This, this is all, all only for this, this world. There are things that are necessary for us to make our journey through this present wilderness. But they won't always be needed in the capacity that we have them now. These things are all done with the world to come in mind. See, hope is a mainstay for the child of God. Yeah. Hope is everything. Amen. So we're not simply living to rise above the world, but we are living to pass even unto the heavenlies, to, to go higher. Our expectation of the world to come and the joys which await us there, they actually allow us to pass this time in which we are now, this time of our sojourning in the wilderness of this life, with joyful anticipation. See, our confidence that the Lord is not only able but willing to fulfill all of these promises that He has given to us, that is what allows us to live in a way which contradicts the way that the world presently looks to us via our natural senses. Which This, this brings us uh, now to the conclusion of this text. For we, to, we hope unto the end for the grace which is to be brought unto us at the re revelation of Jesus Christ. See, all of these things which we've spoken of tonight are meant to prepare us for the coming of our Savior. That's the purpose for them. As I said before, this, this is in our perpetual existence to be in a state of denying ourselves and, you know, fighting against the evil one. It's, it's, there, there will be a time when we'll beat our swords into plowshares and we won't make war anymore. So, uh, uh, this grace which is spoken of, the grace which is to be brought to us, is, is a grace to allow us to stand before a holy God justified in His sight. To, to be able to abide the day of His coming. To be able to, as, as Paul referred to in later in the Ephesians, to having done all, to stand. So this evening as we begin our services, let us do so in the posture which we've spoken of tonight. Let us, let us gird up the loins of our mind. Apply ourselves to use this capacity that the Lord's given us to reason and think upon spiritual things and to be ready to receive from Him what He has, what he has to give us. Let us be sober. Let us cast away any distractions that we have, any things that might drag us down. And uh, as the Lord did when he was with us on the earth, as he set his gaze steadfastly unto Jerusalem, uh, wanting to accomplish the purpose which the Lord has given to us, let us set our gaze heavenward this evening. Let us take, take the hand of the captain of our salvation as he's bringing many sons to glory, and let us march to Zion this evening. Amen. Let's pray, brethren, for...